I'd like you to take the Word of God, please, and turn with me in your Bibles to the little book of 3 John, if you have your Bible open there. I want you to look carefully at the second verse of this epistle. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Notice the closing words of that verse. Thy soul prospereth. And I want to speak to you on the prosperity of your soul. The prosperity of your soul. We might imagine that most everyone we meet would desire to be prosperous. And the Lord has blessed so many in that way. As a matter of fact, when we compare ourselves with people around the world, we have come to a level of living in quality of life that few people in the six and a half billion people in the world will ever achieve. And the Word of God teaches us that it is God that giveth power to get wealth. Prosperity is the goal of many people. But those of us who know the Lord understand there is a tremendous neglect of the greatest prosperity, which is the prosperity of our soul. The Apostle John, with pen in hand and the inspiration of the Spirit of God, wrote an amazing thing here. We shall deal more with it a little later, but it is an amazing thought. When he thought of Gaius, and he thought of the health need that Gaius had to be able to function and serve the Lord, as he desired to function and serve the Lord, he thought of the healthiest thing about Gaius' life. And John, in the inspiration of the Spirit of God, understanding what the healthiest, most vital part of Gaius' life happened to be, and he says... To Gaius, in this letter, I would to God that your health were as prosperous as your soul. Can you imagine if God measured out our health in the same measure as the prosperity of our soul? We might imagine your community or my community or your country or my community and country, if God measured out to equal our physical well-being to the prosperity of our soul, we might be the sickliest, weakest people on earth. There's no doubt that we have not given attention to the prosperity of our soul. I want you to hold your place here just for a moment and turn with me to a passage in the Bible found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When I think about the soul, I, I understand that we talk about the soul of a man, and rightly so. This is the emphasis of this passage. But we can also rightly speak of the soul of a nation, of the soul of a church, of the soul of a family. I won't talk about your nation I'll leave that to you, but I can talk about America. And the soul of America is sick, gravely ill, with sin, awful sin, sickness. The Bible says of man, in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We have an outward man and an inward man. We have a public world and a private world. We have the part that people see and the part that only God sees. And God says the attention we should give most, foremost, in every way, should be the part of life that God and God alone sees. But we well order our public world while neglecting our private secret world. We give the appearance that everything in our public, well-ordered world is running smoothly. While all the while, our souls are not well-ordered at all. And there's a drying up and dying and decaying in the soul. As a pastor of a church and as a pastor for many, many years, I've seen people who have been gravely ill. Recently, we had a dear, dear man in our church 
a man who believed in living a holy life, a dedicated God-fearing Christian who was told that he had a brain tumor. And he knew he was having terrible headaches. They told him later that the brain tumor was inoperable. They would try to give some sort of chemical treatment or some radiation, but frankly it was impossible to take care of it. The doctor tried to explain it to him by saying, somewhere inside your head there's an abnormal growth that you can't see with the human eye, but it's in there. And it's an awful distorted growth. And it's growing rapidly inside your head. It's located, oddly enough, behind your right eye. In that direction. Well, as the tumor progressed, a horrible thing happened. As the tumor grew, it pressed his eye out of its socket and grew through the eye socket and covered the right side of his face. When I would go into his home or my wife go into his home or we'd go together to pray with him, it took a lot of the grace of God just to look at the man with this terribly unsightly Awful looking mass growing out of his eye socket down the side of his face with his eyeball attached out here to the end of it. It was, if you mind, I'm sorry, but to describe it, probably the most hideous looking thing I've ever seen and the most pitiful thing I've ever seen. His wife confided in us saying that It takes all I can do just to look at him and minister to him. And what a good godly woman she is. That mass, that awful mass, that ugly, sightless, that ugly, awful looking thing was in there. And it burst through his eye socket. And became visible to all people. When I think about what I've read to you. I think about how much attention we give to the way we look, the way we dress, the way we speak, the way we appear to people. But there's a God in heaven who looks in our inner man. And he sees this awful mass, this unsightly, horrible looking condition of our souls that have been unattended. And suffer from lack of care and attention. And have been that way for so many years. The prosperity of your soul. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, beginning with verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Verse 4 of Isaiah 1. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel under anger. They have gone away backward. Why should he be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint from the sole of the foot even unto the head. There's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom, give ear 
on the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. God says, when I look at you, there's no soundness. All wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. God says, when He looks at us, what does He see? Will you be frank and honest? You know, God cannot help you as desperately as the Lord wants to help you. And God cannot and will not help me if we're not willing to be honest with Him. What is the condition of your soul? It's sort of like people considering marriage. They have the idea that if an unsaved person marries a saved person, they're unequally yoked. And they are. But it's possible for two saved people to marry one another and still be unequally yoked. One professing faith in Christ with a great love for the Lord and another professing faith in Christ with a cold heart. And in like manner, many people think, well, I'm a believer. My sins are forgiven. I'm robed in His righteousness. Heaven is my home. My soul is saved. But what is the condition, the measure of prosperity in your soul? David dared to pray in the 139th Psalm this prayer in verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. He had in mind the sacrificial lamb to be given as a sacrifice. And when the lamb was put up to be observed to make sure the lamb was a fitting sacrifice without blemish, that was only part of it before the lamb could be offered to God the lamb was slaughtered and killed, put to death, and opened up. And as the lamb was opened up, there was a searching, a penetrating searching going inside every internal organ and everything inside that lamb. And it had to be as perfect as is humanly possible to see to be offered to God. And David said, Lord, cut me open and look inside me. Search me. Look in my soul, my inner man. Because sincerely, truly, I want to be as right with thee as is humanly possible to be. I ask again, what is the prosperity of your soul? What is the prosperity of my soul? The book of Jeremiah, this burdened, weeping prophet, cries out in the 8th chapter, the 22nd verse, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? In other words, is there no healing power? Is there no physician? Would you listen with your heart a moment? Is there no God in heaven who can make your soul prosperous? Oh, yes. Is there no healing for the soul that is not prosperous? Oh, yes then if God is able to make us prosperous in soul, then why are we not prosperous in soul? You see, we talk about revival and we we go through the motions of praying and we say to the Lord, Lord, send a mighty fire fire and may it fall down upon us and God renew the days of old and send power and bless us. and, And the Lord is looking for a fitting sacrifice with a prosperous soul on which to pour out that power. A preacher friend of mine grew up in a rural situation and he used to watch his father with an axe, a double-bladed axe. I imagine you have such a thing here. And The father would chop wood to be burnt in a wood-burning stove. And the boy said, I used to watch my father as a young, young child with that axe. And I always wanted that axe. I want that axe to be mine. And finally I got old enough and I guess in his eyes, mature enough, he called me one day and said, I'm going to let you have this axe. And the boy said, I thought I was getting it as a gift. He said, I learned it was not a gift. It was a tool. And I would be given the axe to use. We go to God as if we want something from Him like a trinket we could carry around and say, Lord, I'd like to just possess some of this or have this... I'd like to add this to my faith or my religion. I'd like to be able to say that I had a little of this happen in my life, a home or church. But God isn't about to pour out His Spirit in great blessing 
like that. He doesn't give of himself as a plaything. Our souls need attention. When the Lord sees the prosperous soul, he can bless. I want you to look with me, please, at this, at this story that we find in 3 John. They're precious truths here. A dear friend of mine is walking in the streets of heaven while we're here still laboring below. Used to say that revival is hindered by a lack of being specific with our sin. We're never going to do any good confessing sin as a general thing. We must be specific about our individual sins. And the great physician is here. And he's searching. He's searching your inner man. Young lady, he's searching your inner man. Young man, he's searching your inner man. The great physician, the God of heaven and earth, the creator God who made you and made me. I am a bloody man standing here preaching. I'm, I'm cut all over with the sword of the Spirit. I, I'm wounded and bleeding from just studying and praying over this as God has dealt with me and cut me with His Word and wounded me as a friend, wounding me. And I must be specific about my sins to gain the health of my soul that I so desperately need. And so must you. I want you to notice, please, we introduced to the well-beloved Gaius. What tender language God uses here. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. The elder, of course, John the Apostle, the one who laid his head on the Lord Jesus, the intimate one with Christ. The last of the apostles to live, outliving all the others. The writer of the five books of the New Testament, I've mentioned to you already. He's writing to a man that he considers to be special, beloved, well-beloved. The well-beloved Gaius. And reveals to us in this passage a, a tenderness that can be found and should be found among God's people. And a love that is only understood by the spiritual-minded person, that we can actually become as close or closer to people in faith as we are in physical family. We can grow in love with people in the Lord, in the Spirit. We can relate literally from one soul to another in the union of God's Spirit. And John was writing with this tenderness as he penned these words on the inspiration of the Spirit of God to the well-beloved Gaius. And I think from time to time we need to stop again and give inventory and great consideration and praise to God for who the Lord has brought across our path and into our lives as believers. On down in the letter, God calls him a fellow helper to the truth. A fellow helper. In other words, here's a man who is helping others in God's work get God's work done. No man really serves the Lord alone, though every man must give an account of himself to God. We serve the Lord with others of God's children, and we're helping one another. And God tells us about this wonderful ministry we can have when our soul is what it ought to be, how we can encourage one another in the Lord and consider another to be well beloved in Christ. As you consider and I consider the wonderful work of God and the family of God and the local assembly of baptized believers in a, in a church like this, are you thinking of people that God has brought across your path that you've learned to love and cherish their friendship and the thing that's brought you together is your mutual love and adoration for the Lord Jesus Christ? See, it's impossible for some people to make true Christian friendships because they may have all the, the human capacity 
and the human feelings, but they do not share the mutual love for the Lord Jesus. John wrote to Gaius, and they loved both of them, loved the Lord Jesus. And it was their mutual love for Christ that brought them together. Wouldn't it be a blessed thing for us to teach our children and our young people and to practice this in our homes, to demonstrate it by the way we live, that God put us in this old sin-cursed world that's going to hell in a hurry. And He left us here after we came to know Him, but He left us here with this great blessed benefit that we can get acquainted in a wonderful way with others of God's children and enjoy this, this fellowship of fellow helpers in the work of the Lord. Is that something you're grateful for? That's part of the prosperous soul. I, I want to learn to be a true Christian friend. As a boy growing up, I had childhood friends, and we can't be children forever. But we can grow into adulthood and become strong friends as men or women. And if I'm going to be a blessed benefit to God's people, then I need to ask God to help me care for the prosperity of my soul so that I'll be able to be a well-beloved brother. To others in the faith. And if you're going to be a help, you're going to have to be a prosperous soul to be a well-beloved brother in the faith. The well-beloved Gaius. Then notice the second thing, and that is the wish above all things. In the very language of the Bible, he writes in verse 2, Beloved, I, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. Now evidently, Gaius was a man who was not, as you might say, physically complete. Some things were missing. Now, most people have the idea that if you're going to serve the Lord, you've got to be like a decathlon athlete, you know. Nothing can be wrong with you. But God takes our physical weaknesses and proves His great strength, doesn't He? As a matter of fact, if the Lord didn't allow us in some ways to wind down physically, we'd become so full of ourselves by the end of this journey, we'd be fit for nothing. But as we grow weaker in body and more helpless as humans, the ideal thing is for us to become more dependent upon God as His children. And he writes to this man and he says, I'm thinking about your health, brother. And I think about your soul, brother. And I think about how prosperous your soul is. And I'm praying that God will bring the measure of your physical health up to the measure of the prosperity of your soul. This is my wish above all things. Keep that soul prosperous to be the measuring rod for your health. In the south where I come from in the United States, there was a famous preacher by the name of R.G. Lee. Robert Green Lee, R.G. Lee. He was called the Prince of Our Preachers. He's now with the Lord. He had a famous sermon he preached, I guess thousands of times, called Payday Someday. It was about Naboth's vineyard and wicked kings and Jezebel and God's payday. Powerful sermon. One time when I was hearing Dr. R.G. Lee preach, he said, Let's imagine that everyone who served the Lord was given their responsibility in God's work according to the prosperity of their soul and their passion for the lost. In other words, the person who had the greatest passion for the lost and was most prosperous in soul would be the pastor. And others who were more prosperous in soul and than most and more passionate for the lost would be the leaders and serving in the Lord's work in the most visible capacities. Imagine that God sorted everything out that way so that there was a spiritual qualification that went along with all of service. And then he said, strangely enough, that's the way it should be. But it doesn't always turn out that way. 
I don't want you to think about the condition of your church for a moment or the condition of your country. I think many times we excuse our lack of caring for the prosperity of our own soul by preaching and teaching against what's going wrong in other people. Sometimes we think if we shout loud about the homosexual community, and we are against that, or we shout out loud about what's going wrong in the country, we think we've done our duty as believers. But I want to ask you this question. What kind of attention are you personally giving to the prosperity of your soul? What are you doing to keep your soul healthy? What are you doing with God? What am I doing? What are you doing with God's Word? Reading, meditating, memorizing, obeying. What are we doing with the witness God has given us? The Lord said to us, you are witnesses. Not you're going to be witnessing, but He said you are now and you are a witness. Because of what you know to be true, you can witness because you are a witness. The noun comes before the verb. It says, oh, you watched something happen out here and you saw it with your own eyes. And the police officers come to investigate and they said, did somebody see this? Do we have a witness? And someone came around the corner and said, well, I didn't see it, but I'd like to tell you what I think happened. The officer would say, I'm not interested in what you think happened. I want to know if somebody saw it. Give me a, a real witness. God says, you and I are real witness to the grace of God. We are really witnesses to the blood of Jesus Christ and His power to cleanse our sin. We are real witnesses to what the Holy Spirit can empower us to do in our victories. And we are to witness because we are witnesses. What are we doing about the prosperity of our soul? You see, you don't become soul prosperous simply by just attending church or owning a Bible or identifying with a group of believers. It is an individual action of our own will. It's something of our own volition. We must care for our soul like it is a garden in the inner man. And if we neglect it, it will be grown over with weeds and nasty, putrefying things. And the truth of the matter is, you could be a preacher, a missionary, an evangelist, a Bible college student, and have let your soul become weak and anemic and without prosperity. This is a personal thing. He said, My wish, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Then there's a third thing here. Not only the well-beloved Gaius and the wish above all things, but the walk of the prosperous soul. Let's read on. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Well, why is he walking in the truth? Have you heard the expression in Northern Ireland, sometimes we get the cart before the horse? We, we know that, right? Did you grow up with that expression? Maybe I can get you to raise your hand on that. Did you grow up with that expression? Good for you. It's great to respond to some things, isn't it? It didn't hurt at all to raise your hand, did it? God bless you. Now we're participating, aren't we? Too bad we're not having a soccer match. We'd see how much enthusiasm you had, you know? Not on the Lord's Day. I'm being a little cutting here. You see what I'm saying? We need real enthusiasm for the work of God. Did you know that business as usual is not going to accomplish God's great work in this wicked hour in which we live? It's going to take going over the top, beyond the ordinary. You understand that? Religious routine is never going to accomplish what needs to be done in this crisis hour of human history. It cannot happen that way. He said, I know that you walk in the truth. Now, the truth is the truth among truth. We have truth, but there's the truth in the truth. The truth, the Lord Jesus. The truth. Even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And oh, may the Spirit of God help me now. May God help me. 
the walk of the prosperous soul. You see, we try to convince people to do things they don't want to do. We try to use every motive imaginable to get people to participate in Christian activity when they really don't want to participate in Christian activity. We'd like to say to people, here's a formula for revival. But what God reveals to us in this little epistle of Third John is that when we get our soul prosperous, the prosperous soul desires to walk in the truth. It comes from within. I don't know if you have this problem in this part of the world. Honestly, everything seems nearly perfect to us when we come and visit you. <laughs> it does. It really does. We sort of beat ourselves up as Americans thinking, well, we wish we were as, as right with God as those people are. We really do. I'm, I'm not being facetious. I'm not trying to kid you. I, I think we've learned so much about the Lord and about prayer and so I don't know if you have this problem or not as we do, but I hear parents come to me as a pastor. And they say, well, my son likes a girl. He's interested in a girl, and she's not the right kind of girl. I don't like her. And I say to them, he does. Or they come to me and they say, my daughter is interested in a certain boy, and we don't think he's good for her. And I say to them, she does. And until something inside of her, until something inside of him changes, that's what they're going to continue to want. Do you and I understand how essential the prosperous soul is to the Christian life? You see, the Christian life isn't to be lived where we have to constantly make people, like tying them up or forcing them with threat of death to do what they ought to do, or imagining God is like a dirty bully running around with a club to knock them in the head the first time they do wrong. Uh, that, that's not the way the Christian life is to be lived. We have to serve the Lord not in order to, but because of what He has done for us. We love Him. Why? Because Why? Because why? He first loved us. And the prosperous soul cared for is the soul that says, I love the Lord. I want to walk with the Lord. I want only what God wants. I want to do what God wants me to do. It walks in the truth because it desires the Lord and He is the truth. Often we try to get people to do things and we try to imagine every motive that we can use to get them to do things. But the truth of the matter is, when people are abiding in Christ who know the Lord and learn to love the Lord and keep their soul like it ought to be, guard their eye gate and their ear gate so the wrong things don't get in, who care and nurture the things of God, who give the Lord the time that He richly deserves to abide in Him and in His Word, who care for the inner man. These are people... God help me so often I'm not that kind of person. But these are people who will choose to walk in the truth because it comes from within. Would you just sort of sit up in your heart and listen for a moment? We do need revival. And I can't bring it. Days of old, I like to read the stories, don't you? I can't come to this country without hearing about W.P. Nicholson. I'll meet him someday in heaven. I'm not so sure that all of us would have liked him if we'd been with him. But we'd have liked what God did with him. We would have enjoyed seeing the results of that kind of life. I'm sure he seemed strange to lots of people. But for those days of Holy Ghost baptism and fire and revival... Oh, yes. These chapels in England with no pastors. I can't preach there without people coming up to me in these rallies we've had, without people coming up to me. Sometimes in one meeting, six or seven different people saying, we have no minister. We've been without a minister 25 years. We don't have a minister. There are millions of children in Britain, millions of them, 
who've never learned one Bible verse, who don't, don't have a Bible to read. They, they don't know anything about the Ten Commandments and the law of God. They wouldn't understand there's a holy God who tells us that we're sinners by nature. We're born spiritually dead and we must be redeemed to get to heaven. They, they don't have any idea about that. My heart hurts for those children and I, I know that many, many thousands of them could be reached because the gospel has never lost its power. But why doesn't it happen? Because we've made our faith a form in most places. And we keep the same form. And we hide behind that form and never really care individually, personally, for the prosperity of our souls. So how do you know that? Because I am so guilty of it myself. I know all the cute little Christian things to say. All the phrases to use. All the words at the appropriate time. I've become very good at it after all these years. But sometimes, in the most serious moments of my life, Sometimes in the most serious moments of my life, it's a frightening thing to think what God must see from what I have neglected. How ugly and hideous it must look to God when it should be so beautiful and Christ-like. I wonder if there is a handful of people in this place who would say, I want to get right with God and care for the prosperity of my soul so I can give the Lord the opportunity to bless me and use me as He desires to bless me and use me. I'll give you the hardest thing you could do right now. I wonder while I'm speaking if somebody would just stand up and say, that's what I want. I mean now. That's what I want. The prosperity of my soul. That's what I want. Just remain with us a moment. Let's give you an opportunity. What putrefying, wicked thing must God see inside when He looks? We haven't cared for our soul like we ought to. I believe it'd be fitting either where you're sitting or out in the aisle or here at an altar to find a place to pray and say, God, help me. Help me. Help me with the prosperity of my soul. Help me. Help me. There's someone here away from God, so far away from God. You've tried everything imaginable to make things work right. It never will until the inner man is cared for. It's soul sickness. There are people here, no doubt, that have never been born of God's Spirit. You can try all you will, but your your soul is as black as the charred walls of hell. And only Jesus can wash it white as snow. You ought to come and say, I want someone to pray with me. I want to come to the Lord. I want want God to save me. I'm a condemned sinner. I can't save myself. No way. 
Oh, wash me white in the blood of Jesus. Wash me white in the blood of Jesus. Wash me white and clean. Let's pray all over the building. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank Thee. We thank Thee, Lord, for giving us the grace to say these things. I thank Thee, Father, for giving me mercy extended to me. Wash me white and clean. When I read of this dear brother that I shall see in heaven, Gaius. And when I read that John, the beloved apostle, was so so freely willing to write and pray that his physical health would be as his soul prospered. I think how ashamed I am at how sick I would be physically. Because of the lack of attention I've given to my soul. And for those who are still in sin, awaken them to their sinful condition. And may they cry out to thee for cleansing. Who among us would cry out to God for cleansing now? Cleanse me, wash me white. In the precious blood of Jesus, wash me white and clean. Who would cry out to Jesus for salvation? Wash me white and clean. This is your your day of salvation. Now is accepted time. How many of you are greatly burdened for someone far away from God? And you're praying for them. They're stomping over their own soul. Neglecting their own soul, the most precious thing they have. Your heart is so burdened. And you'd say, someone pray with me and help me. Wash me white. I wish our choir had a song about being washed white in the blood. We don't have to have a song. A hymn we could sing. Wash me white and clean. Cleanse me in his precious blood. Dear Pastor, I believe the Lord is with us. There's an arresting moment here. There's there's an arresting moment right now here. Where God is giving us opportunity as the Lord prompts you you come and do as he pleases as we simply seek the face of God before his throne God knows your heart friend we're here to help you in Jesus precious name please do not go away from the house of the Lord without settling the issues before the Lord. We are here as God's servants. Lord, wash me and I shall be wet in the snow. Him writer says, Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol Cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Friend, don't leave God's house without getting to the blood of the Lamb. Father, bless thy word to our hearts. Give to sight and grace right now. For we pray in Jesus' precious name.
Amen.